Hi guys. Um, I've been doing quite a bit of book shopping over the past few weeks, and a few weeks ago I made my first book haul video, and uh, showed about, I think, 18 or 20 books that I would bought over the couple of weeks before that, and since I've bought about as many more again. I had a short little trip to Austin, and visited a bookstore there, and just got back from Dallas a few days ago, which, if you didn't know, is where the uh, flagship store for Half Price Books is in the uh, United States. And I think it's the biggest Half Price Bookstore in the U.S. It's uh, a nice store. If you ever have a chance, uh, definitely uh, drop by. I got about seven or eight books from both stores, and um, all of these books are just from those two bookstore visits. So um, just wanted to share these with you, see what you thought of them. The first one is called The Unauthorized Version, Truth and Fiction in the Bible by Robin Lane Fox. Um, this is Robin Lane Fox's historian, uh, mostly of ancient Rome, I think, but uh, he branched out a bit. This isn't really a book about so much a, a believer or someone trying to defend certain religious creeds, at least by, by peeking in the front cover and reading the back. It's about a historian's analysis of the Bible. What can be verified, what can't be, etc. So that's interesting and, and that interests me um, just for that reason, just for a, a sort of objective peek at what the Bible has to offer. next book is by James Joyce the portrait of a portrait of the artist as a young man um, this is probably pretty useful if you want to you know read maybe Ulysses or or to a lesser extent Finnegan's Wake in a better fuller informed way I guess this book does have some autobiographical elements to it, but from what I understand, it's supposed to be a work of fiction, but uh, it'll be interesting to see how much rings true biographically. Uh, next is a book by someone else I have an unread book by. Um, this is uh, Thunder at Twilight, Vienna, 1913 and 1914, uh, that would be right before the outbreak of World War I, by uh, Frederick Morton, who also wrote a book called Nervous Splendor, which is uh, about the assassination of a Habsburg prince around the same time in the uh, 19 teens. Haven't read it yet, but um, they are supposed to be very good, sort of catching that. Um, very early 20th century uh, spasms of modernity and in Vienna thing, which has always interested me. Next is a, a novel by Theodore Fontaine. It's uh, one of those uh, NYRB repen reprints, New York a Review of Books. They put these out and uh, for books that they think, you know, don't have enough of a reading audience or have somehow slipped out of print or become ignored. This one has an afterword by Philip Lopate. Theodore Fontaine was a, I believe he was Prussian born and is probably one of the better known German language novelists of the 19th century. Maybe his, his most remembered novel today is called Effie Breist, which I also have but haven't read yet. But he's supposed to be really uh, psychologically insightful and an interesting writer. So not having read Effie Breist yet, I wanted to get this because it's, quite frankly, I think it's the only other novel I've ever seen in print by him. So I didn't want to pass getting that up. Next is The Icon and the Axe 
An Interpretive History of Russian Culture by James H. Billington. And other than saying it's an interpretive history of Russian culture, there's, there's not much to say, it, uh, say about it, I should say. Um, he goes back quite a ways. You know, I'm just opening up the book to the beginning here, and I saw the, the year 1049. So uh, it goes back to at least medieval Russia. By the way, the guy who wrote the book, James H. Billington, is the current librarian of Congress. Uh, and has been for about 25 years. He's now in his 80s, but when he was just up and coming in the academic world, he was known as a Russianist, uh, someone who specialized in Russian culture, literature, music, and all of that good stuff. And he actually wrote this in the 60s. So it's been out for a while, but I've never seen anything by him that I remember, or if I had, it was exorbitantly expensive. I got this for a dollar in Dallas. A dollar. Um, I'm lucky. Um, but anyway, um, the names of the name, of course, just popped out uh, right at me. Uh, being James Billington. Okay, what next? Let's see. By the way, all of these are going to be um, in case you're interested in anything in the off chance and want to write something down. They're all in the drop-down box below. They're not in order, in the order that I'm talking about them in the drop-down box, but they're all there, all 17 of them. So uh, the full name of the book and the author's there. No Amazon links or anything like that. Um, I didn't want to make the box too full. But just in case you were interested there, they're all there for you. The next is a book by Tony Jute called Reappraisals. Reflections on the Forgotten 20th Century. Uh, you may have heard a couple of years ago, Tony Jute passed away. He had a, a kind of motor neuron disease which basically allowed his body to totally, slowly degenerate while his mind remained completely intact. A horrible way to die. And he was... He was teaching and, and giving lectures and talking for, for pretty much you know, all the time he could up until the very, very end. And uh, he wrote a history of Europe after 1945 called, uh, I think it's called Post-War Europe, which is just massive. Uh, I have it in my bedroom and sometimes I'll, I'll dip through it right before I go to bed. It's a wonderful book, about a thousand pages long, a really comprehensive look at things from a really well-documented, well-sourced, scholarly point of view. And this book is a series of essays on a number of topics. Just going through. Uh, there's a, there's a, an essay on Eric Hobsbawm, who also recently passed away, the, the, Marxist, the Marxist historian. There's one on Edward Said. Uh, let's see, there's one on Israel's Six-Day War. One on Arthur Kessler, uh, the, the man who wrote Darkness at Noon about the Stalinist show trials. One about Primo Levi, one about Hannah Arendt. One on Albert, Albert Camus. Just, just a wonderful collection of things. This guy was really smart and wonderfully well read. So, um, in in my attempt to be the same, I thought I would pick these up and uh, and give these a read. Uh, Reappraisals, reflections on the forgotten twentieth century by Tony Ju. Next up is a bit of guilty pleasure reading, I guess. The Mysteries of Udolfo <laughs> by Anne Radcliffe. Sort of a, a thick little doorstop of a book. Uh, Anne Radcliffe was introduced to me by probably my best friend in high school who was an Anne Radcliffe fanatic. Uh, of course, I mean, who knew who Anne Radcliffe was in high school? I certainly didn't, and I thought I was relatively well read. Well, he loved her. He'd read everything, uh, probably 
half a dozen of her books. And she was uh, a novelist in the latter part of the 18th century, first part of the 19th. And she writes these sort of very gothic, very gothic, romantic, kind of uh, Horace Walpole, Castle of Otranto type of stories. And I've always had a place in my heart for those. I think they're very um, sort of gratuitous, but also fun to read in the dark and at night. So I got it. Also a dollar. Next is The Gate of Heavenly Peace. And the subtitle is The Chinese and the Revolution by Jonathan D. Spence. Jonathan D. Spence is a, a sinologist, someone who specializes in uh, Chinese history, culture. And this is basically, as far as I can tell, um, with a bit of background, uh, a history from 1949 when Mao takes power up through the, the 1970s when he finally dies. And I think it covers the, the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution and all of that. Uh, looking at the at the beginning, it looks to provide a little bit of context, but um, my knowledge of, of Chinese history is is sorely lacking. So I picked these this up as soon as I found it, and um, he is at Yale. I want to say, you know, double check that. I might be wrong. He's the Sterling Professor of History at Yale University. And a Guggenheim Fellow. So he knows what he's talking about. Alright. Uh, this next one is called The Hour of Our Death by uh, Felipe Ries. Felipe Ries. Um, sort of a, another big book. Philippe Ri is known, I think, uh, for being mostly affiliated with the Annales school of French historiographical writing. And I'd never seen anything by him that wasn't really, really expensive or that wasn't in the library. So I just had to have this. And it has a bunch of beautiful pictures in it. And it basically talks about how people have perceived death, how it's talked about in music and art and literature from you know, the height of the Middle Ages, about a thousand years ago or so, up until the present day. And this is just one of those kind of specialty off the wall books that I love running across. So um, I'm gonna really enjoy reading this. A more history book. Richard II and the Revolution of 1399 by Michael Bennett. This was uh, also on the clearance shelf for a dollar. This has a lot of wonderful uh, full page pictures in it. And I love, uh, I, I should say, reproductions of, of paintings and photographs and I love medieval art and architecture so you get uh, things like this the the Canterbury Cathedral nave looking east I mean I, I think things like that are, are really pretty so that was one of the things that that when you get this and it's also just a a history of the of the, the revolution of 1399. I love medieval history and I, I, I really love English history. So putting those two together, um, I thought I would get that one. And then these next two kind of go together. So let me show you together what they are. There we go. Okay. Um, this is volume two and volume three of Naguib Mahfouz's uh, trilogy called uh, the Cairo Trilogy. The Cairo Trilogy is um, 
by Mahfouz to date. I think he is the only Egyptian author to have ever won the Nobel Prize in Literature. I have volume one sitting on my shelf, and I've never read it. But I didn't want to start it unless I had volumes two and three to finish them off. So when I saw these, I thought I'd get them as soon as I saw them. Um, it's kind of... It's, it's one of those sets of books that uh, really has, apparently, the, the city of Cairo at its heart as one of its main characters. And I think Mahfouz takes a lot of inspiration from writers like Balzac in writing these kind of social, realist novels that um, almost in a European tradition, but I, I don't want to say that unless I start reading it. But... Uh, having had volume one, I had to have the other two, and um, I really want to read these, so I'll probably be um, reading these and reviewing these, not in the far too distant future. Next up is Hirohito and the Making of Modern Japan by Herbert P. Bix. This actually won the Pulitzer Prize a number of years ago, and... It's, uh, it's a, a biography of Hirohito, but also, you know, sort of detailing the very important historical events that happened to occur during his life, most namely, you know, the bombing of, of, of Pearl Harbor and the fighting of World War II. He lived a pretty long life, dying just in, I think, 1988 or 1989, so, um, an interesting life and and uh, a look at you know that last part of of the of the 19th century and, and coming into the 20th I think it's kind of a <clears throat> an interesting look at what might have been the last time to see a, a certain kind of Japanese culture uh, before it turned completely modern Penguin History has uh, come out with a number of really interesting series. And one of them is a series on English history. They have, I think, a shorter series on French history and um, a, a couple of others. But this is the last one in the Penguin History of Britain. It's called uh, Hope, Hope and Glory. Britain, 1900 and 1990, by Peter Clark. I'm actually reading the one by Mark Kishlansky right now on the Stewarts from, was it, I, th I think, 1603 to 1714, right after the um, unification but it covers all of the uh, all of the Stuart monarchs, and uh, 17th century British history is something that interests me. But I should probably know more about. So I'm reading that right now. Um, it, it might take me a while to, to finish it. These things usually are um, a little academic and sometimes a little dense if you're not really familiar with the history already. But as soon as I finish it, I'll put up a review for you guys, and you can tell me what you think about that one. One thing I don't read enough of is poetry. I own scads of it, probably a couple of hundred volumes of it, but I don't tend to read that much of it. However, I do like older poetry, um, so when I saw this, I, I needed it. Um, <laughs> this is George Herbert and the 17th Century Religious Poets. It's put out by Norton. You can probably tell by the just the general shape of the cover, that it's a Norton imprint. It's got George Herbert, um, Andrew Marvell, Richard Cashaw, um, Henry Vaughan, Thomas Trayern, and uh, it has a number of uh, interpretive uh, texts at the end by, you know, a number of critics and 
and writers to try to explain some of the the poems and the poets themselves. I love critical editions like this that give you the the poems in the front and then you know of course you can think through the poetry for yourself and sort of mull over the language and sort of ask yourself what they're trying to do with the poetry but you also have these sort of experts in the back that sort of help you push you along in, in, in certain directions. I always like the the balance between letting you do your own work in the front and then having those interpretive essays in the back. Okay, just two more to go. Let's see, which one first? How about this one? <coughs> this one is called Mao's Great Famine, the history of China's most devastating catastrophe, 1958 to 1962 by Frank Dickotter. Uh, the only reason I picked this up was because I follow someone on Twitter who actually mentioned it in a tweet. That person, by the way, is uh, Chris L. Hayes, who hosts Up on MSNBC with Chris Hayes. And uh, one of his friends mentioned this in a tweet, and he retweeted it. So, um, and then I happened to look up to Cotter's name, and he's sort of uh, done some really pioneering work with the archives that have just recently opened up in China detailing you know the horrific things that happened when Mao was in charge trying to centralize the agrarian economy and, and basically just ruining the country so uh, when I saw his name and when I saw it was the same book that was mentioned uh, in that tweet I just sort of made an impulsive buy another step towards my uh, learning more about Chinese history. Uh, oh my goodness, this was 10 pounds. Um, <laughs> this last one is by Richard Overy. It's called The Dictators, Hitler's Germany and Stalin's Russia. And uh, this is actually the winner, I think it was this book, not just Richard Overy in general, that won the Wolfson Prize, which is... Um, a pretty prestigious prize in history. Um, basically what it is, is it's a comparative history and a comparative study of Hitler and Stalin. Uh, not only from their <clears throat> sort of cult of personality, but also just from the way they ran their countries, how they administered things, how they, how they made their country tick. And I think uh, comparative history is a, a pretty pretty interesting uh, pursuit, especially when you can find something like this that's, you know, at least ostensibly meant for uh, non-professional readers. It's uh, it's awfully thick. I mean, it runs to 850 pages, and it's got quite a few footnotes. So um, <laughs> we'll see how far I can get, but um, the idea seems interesting at least. Um, so that's my last book. Um, if you've heard of any of these or, or certainly read them, let me know. Let me know what you think. Uh, give me a comment. Um, tell me what you want me to review. I, you know, gladly take recommendations. Not just any recommendations, but something I've already listed in a book haul. Uh, thanks for watching, and uh, I'll probably be posting another one of these in a few weeks. Thanks, guys.